Oh. <laughs> you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be back here with you and, and sharing uh, together in, in worship. A few things by way of announcement. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Monday the 14th, MWI Ladies will meet here at 7.30 p.m. The speaker will be Melissa Newell, uh, speaking on her, her work in, in Ecuador. So that's one uh, not to be missed tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. Uh, this Wednesday, um, there's uh, no Bible study this week due to a meeting elsewhere, but that will resume again the following uh, Wednesday. Um, Friday night at 7.30, as you well know by now, I hope, we're having a very special concert with Seven Towers Male Voice Choir and with uh, supporting artists, Laura Kales and uh, Joshua and Jeremiah as well. A uh, recommended donation for that is uh, £10. Um, your support would be very much appreciated. It definitely will be a, a wonderful uh, night. Um, help will be needed on Friday afternoon to set up um, the, the hall, stage, chairs, etc. from 2pm. So if you can, come along uh, Friday at 2pm. That would be greatly appreciated. And then obviously after the concert to put things away again. So don't, don't rush away. Uh, morning worship next Sunday will be led by Reverend Ken Robinson. Um, next Sunday night, uh, the Navy Church Harvest at 7 p.m. The speaker is the Reverend Ian Ferguson. Everybody's welcome along to, to that service. Uh, the bowling club will resume again on Friday the, the 25th of October at, at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Please note the new time. That's Friday the 25th at 3 p.m. if you're free, I definitely come along to that. Any person interested, um, speak to Charles about that after this morning's service. You'll be greatly, greatly welcome, and it's a great time of fellowship and fun for all of you to come along. At uh, 9th of November, uh, Craig Moore are holding an afternoon tea at 2 p.m. If you require, uh, if you'd like tickets, uh, please contact uh, Paddy Gilbert. Uh, from uh, Craig Moore, you can speak to me if you want to get in touch with her and you don't know how. So 9th of November, Craig Moore holding an afternoon tea at 2 p.m. Turn over the page, there's nothing there. That's all our uh, announcements. It's great to have so many, so many things uh, uh, going on. Let's stand and worship God as we sing together. Love divine, all loves makes in. Thank you.
let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, this morning, gathered to worship you, we stand in awe of your divine love. Your divine love that has no body mark in it. That is so, that's unlimited in its understanding. It's compassion. It's patience. And it's mercy. But how awesome to think that, that through our trust in you, that love is in us. As an ever flowing, inexhaustible fountain, as a resource from which we can be channels of your presence and your grace to this world. We thank you that the challenges we face in life, the hard times we go through, that we don't go through them alone. We don't have to rise above adversities by our own strength, by our own resolve. But we do so in, in the way that it's not us, but you living through us. Thank you that the one who is in us is greater than anything we will ever face in this world. Bow together in your holy presence. We're mindful of the times and ways that we have fallen short of your glory, the, the, the times and the ways we have, we have missed the, the mark. We confess our sins to you, our Saviour, to you who took our place, assured and humble that, that you have already paid for them in full, that you came not to be served but to serve, to give your life as a ransom for each and every one of us, that though we deserve death and condemnation, that we might have life and eternal acceptance in your presence as your children. What we have, the life we have, the hope we have, the joy we have, the peace we have. We have not merited or earned in any way, but we have freely given it to us. When we came before you and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <coughs> Thank you that you took our sins, you gave us your righteousness. And in that assurance, we go forth to shine for you in this world, knowing that it's not us, but it's you living in and through us. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will meet with us afresh. You will change us evermore into your likeness. Be glorified, be exalted, be, be lifted up through your worship. Fill our hearts afresh and anew with your joy, with your joy, your peace, and your love. To you be all glory and praise, for you alone are worthy. And we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Hi, for the young people uh, among us and those uh, young at heart, I've got something to show you. For those of you here last time, I left Buzz at home. He was a very naughty boy, so I I brought a toy that hopefully hopefully won't cause me any troubles or interrupt me during my sermon later. So I've got here one of my well favourite toys. I don't know what you call it, but as you can see, it's very small. But when you throw it up, oh, 
I can't a big, a big ball. <laughs> so that reminds me a little bit of what it's like to be a, a Christian. You now each of us have been blessed with wonderful <laughs> things by God. So we've got roofs over our heads, we've got uh, people who love us, we've got clothes on our backs, and, and we've, we've all sorts of resources, we've all sorts of, of gifts and, and talents and abilities. God's given amazing things to each and every one of us. You know, when we keep them all to ourselves and, and use them only to serve ourselves, they remain small. But when we give everything we have up to God, to be used by him to share his love in this world, to tell people about Jesus, that to help those who are struggling. When we give what we have up to God, he turns it into something big, something amazing. But that, that, that our little gifts, when we give them to God, he will do things with them that are far bigger than we could ever comprehend. I thank you so much for listening. You've all been very good. <laughs> I'll this away for now. I'll set it over here so it will not disturb me in any way later. We now receive our offering for God. sharing of your gospel and your love with those who need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Let's stand and sing together, King of Ages. I will done this hymn once before and I managed okay, so, so hopefully it will be a smooth rendition today. It's, it's absolutely beautiful words to, to worship God with. King of ages, almighty God.
Let's unite our hearts in prayer as we consider the needs of others. Let's pray. King of the ages, almighty, just, and true, we stand in awe of you who transcends all things. Who transcends all things, yet is imminent, near, and personal to each and every one of us who calls upon your name. You are over all, through all, and in all. You are infinite in power, in might, in wisdom, and knowledge. Yet you made a way for each and every one of us to, to personally know and walk with you in relationship with you. And it's through that way, the way of your son Jesus, of our trust in him and what he has done for us. That we bow before you now. That we open our hearts to you and pour out to you all that is in them. Lord, we lift before you those in our church family here who are struggling with ill health. Lord, you know what they're going through. You know the challenges, the difficulties, frustrations. We pray for your healing hand. We would pray that you would remove anxieties and, and worries about test results that, that people are waiting for. That each person with their struggles, each person with their ailments would know that they're resting secure in the arms of him who knows the end from the beginning. For those who, who mourn, struggling to come to terms with bereavements, we pray that you continue to meet them with your comfort. Lord, we thank you for your church family here in this place, for the love these your people have for, for one another and this community, for the way people are made to feel welcome and at home. Lord, may we continue to grow together in your love. And as we seek you, as we cry out to you, as we look to you, And you open our eyes as to how we can share it more and more with, with one another and, and more and more with this, this community, this village. How we can share your, your son, Jesus, that, that people might come to know him. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that you have given us, the opportunities you have enabled us to take. And we pray that you would enable us to, to see and to take more and more. For there is much work to be done for the cause of your kingdom in this area. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers into his harvest. I just thank you for the gifts, the, the graces that each and every one has here. Help us to see how we can continue to use them in, in our daily lives and in the ministry of this church to, to make you known, to, to help those who are struggling and in need. Lord, you have so much you can accomplish through each and every one of us. As we are sensitive to your spirit, as we are sensitive to your leading. Lord, send, send us out into your harvest field to do your work. Assured that, that it's not our sufficiency, it's not our abilities that, that matter, but it's it's your grace, it's you living through us, that, that nothing is impossible for you to accomplish through any one of us. Lord, we lift before you our world. We think of places where there is an increasing tension. We think of places where there is, is war. Lord, in the, the um, Middle East especially and, and Ukraine, or humanly, there doesn't appear to be solutions to these conflicts or, or a resolve for them to end. Lord, we, we pray for wisdom, grace, humility for all, 
all uh, leaders and in, in those areas and, and world leaders who have influence. But they would use their, their influence to de-escalate, not further escalate. We pray for a, a, a just and fair settlement for, for all who are suffering. We pray for, for Christians in these regions where, where there is wars. We, we thank you for their witness in, in patiently enduring injustice in responding to, to evil with good. We pray that your gospel in its power and its glory would, would do what human wisdom cannot do. Lord, looking at some of the struggles and difficulties and uncertainties in our world, Lord, it can be easy to, to lose heart. But we thank you that we are in the hands of him who knows the end from the beginning. We are in the hands of him who is accomplishing his good and holy and glorious purposes in all that's unfolding. We thank you that, that the things that are beyond our control, beyond our understanding, that it's not beyond your control and your understanding. We trust ourselves to you. We seek to, to walk with you each and every day, to be instruments of your peace, your grace, your love and your mercy wherever we go. Use us as we seek you. To you be all glory, honour and praise. We thank you that you receive from us all that is on our heart. <clears throat> and that you do abundantly above all that we can ask for our imagine. We praise you that as we give you what's on our heart, you give us your peace that surpasses all understanding. To you, your glory, honour and praise. You're a, a, a wonderful saviour. You're our closest friend. You're the one who never lets us down. The one who understands us who knows us in a way that no one else does. We thank you that you care for us with infinite love, that you hold us and all that concerns us in your hands. To you be all glory, honour and praise as we worship you, for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. We turn now to God's Word. This morning we read from Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 to 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 to 11. These are the words of the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Philippi. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We thank God for his word to us. Let's stand and sing together before the throne of God above. <laughs> Yeah. 
about a 86-year-old lady she knew who had relatives in America. The lady had never spoken to her relatives, nor had she been to America. But she finally decided to go and arranged with them by email that they would pick her up at the airport. When she got to the airport, a man met her and said, Are you waiting for someone to, to pick you up? Yes, she answered. I'm supposed to pick up a, a, a lady with white hair and a blue dress, but I wasn't expecting anyone anywhere near as beautiful as you. Flattered by his comments, she accompanied him and they left the airport together in his car. The man asked, have you been to America before, Dorothy? No, she replied, and so the conversation continued with the man calling her Dorothy. She thought to herself, if I'm going to be in the car with this man for three hours, I better tell him, my name's not Dorothy. So she told him, my name's Edna. The man asked, is your middle name Dorothy? No. Do people call you Dorothy? No. Are you not Dorothy so-and-so from, from London? No, I'm Edna from Belfast. Without saying another word, the man spun his car around, headed back to the airport as quick as he could, and dropped her off of her relatives who were beside themselves with worry. When she told this story to my friend, my friend said to her, Edna, are you crazy? Why did you ask the man who he was? He could have been anyone, anything could have happened to you. What were you thinking? Edna replied, when you're 86 <laughs> and a man calls you beautiful, <laughs> you don't ask any questions. <laughs> You just go with him. Each of us, like Edna, have an inclination to act on what makes us feel good, feel valued in the moment, and what gives us instant pleasure 
and satisfaction. More often than not, this leads to trouble. It leads away from the one who holds us in his heart and is committed to our eternal well-being. True Christian love, the love Paul speaks about in this passage, doesn't ask first and foremost, does this make me feel good in the moment? Rather it asks first and foremost, is this good and true as revealed by God in his word? In the first six verses of this chapter, Paul assures the Philippian believers that God has begun a work of grace in their lives that he will bring to completion. He starts this passage by saying in verse 7, It's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. The words, I have you in my heart, they can equally be translated, you have me in your heart. At the very least, they speak of mutual affection. Paul is sure there's a genuine work of grace in their lives that God will bring to completion because in their hearts, at the very core of their being, is genuine Christian love, genuine concern, compassion and care for one another and those around them. This genuine Christian love expressed itself through them in their sacrificial support of Paul on his missionary journeys, and in them standing by Paul during his present imprisonment for the gospel, even though doing so could have dangerous consequences for them. As we look at this passage, we see the source of Christian love, how we can grow in this love, and the result of doing so. So what's the source of true Christian love? Verse 8. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. The source is Jesus Christ. Paul longed for his brothers and sisters in the Lord, not with his own affection, but with the affection of Jesus. He loved them as Jesus loved them, because it was Jesus loving them through him. Scripture tells us in many places that when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we're a new creation and we have a new nature, in which it's no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Saviour, in his power, in his love, living in me. Loving as Jesus loved with selfless love, that puts the benefit and the good of the other before my own, is not seen as a burden to be resented by our new nature. Rather, it's seen as, as a delight and a joy, because Jesus lives in me as an ever-flowing, inexhaustible spring of his love. Jesus is the source of self-emptying, self-giving, Christian love. He lives in us who believe in him as a fountain of this love, causing us to desire as he desires. To have as much joy and delight in forgiving others, serving others, praying for those who oppose and wrong us, as he did. With him being the source of Christian love, causing us to desire as, as he desires, You'd think growing in love, that it would be easy, it would be straightforward. Just do what you want to do, do what makes you happy in every given moment, and you'll <coughs> grow in love. We all know from experience, it's not that easy. Sometimes what we want, it's not what God wants for us. Because we still have an old nature within us, this side of, of glory. An old nature within us that puts temporary self-interest before the good of others. That puts our instant satisfaction before the lasting satisfaction of purity and faithfulness and obedience. Thus, if we're to grow in love, the first question we, we must ask before we act is not, does this action make me feel good instantly? But rather, is this action good and true? 
This approach to, to growing in love and what we use scripture as our compass, scripture as our, our plumb line. It's what Paul advocates to the Philippians with these words, verse 9 and 10. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. This is a stark contrast to what our culture advocates. I read an article in a, a Christian magazine a, a while back. It was about a, a well-known Christian blogger and conference speaker in, in America. After walking out on her husband and, and, a, and, a, and embarking on a way of life that was in clear contradiction to the Word of God, she said this to her followers when she was announcing her change in circumstances. The most revolutionary thing a person can do is not explain themselves. My most sacred responsibility is to be so comfortable in my own skin that I become more interested in my own joy and freedom than what others think about me. The greatest gift any of us can give this world is our true self. Let's not look to anyone for permission or feel obligation for explanation. Human beings flourish as they obey their own desires. Her words sum up the change in values that's happened in society that we can sometimes go along with. The change I'm talking about is this. The degree to which our life is worthwhile and fulfilled is no longer measured by the glory we bring to God, by the contribution we make to the health of family and society. It's, it's no longer measured by these external things, but rather the degree to which my life is worthwhile and fulfilled is measured by the instant benefit and satisfaction I bring to myself. God has been displaced. I am on the throne now. The love of Christ that wells up within us when we believe in him stands in contradiction to this great sea change. It seeks knowledge and discernment of God's will. What matters to, to, to this love is, is, is to know how to act a, a, according to God's will in, in, in the concrete situations of life. Unlike self-love, it sees beyond whether an action makes us feel good in the moment to whether it will lead to lasting happiness and good. Unlike self-love, it sees beyond the temporary security that comes from staying within the, the limits of, of my abilities and what I can control to the lasting security that comes from stepping out into that place where we're completely dependent on God. That place where we're obeying the, the promptings of, of, of the Spirit to, to share that word of kindness, that, that, that word of witness. The place where we're dependent on, on, on the Spirit to, to take on the, 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 the role that he's asking us to take on. Where only he controls the outcome and we have no control of it. Self-love that does not seek to grow in the knowledge of God's will. That seeks only instant ease and gratification. This this self-love, it, it can't bring about lasting transformation and healing. Let me illustrate with a few examples. I love my children. They really don't like doing their homework and helping about the house. This is, I'm making this up by the way, it's not true <laughs> at all. <coughs> doing their homework and helping about the house, that, that stresses them out. That frazzles their little brains. They're much more relaxed, much more at ease when their heads are buried in their phones playing, uh, playing games, um, chatting to their friends, social media, whatever else. So the loving thing to do is just to, just to let them do that all the time. I love myself. Burying my head in my work keeps me from having to deal with the breakdown that's happened in my relationship with the chasm that's opened up. So the loving thing to do is to allow myself to keep hiding. 
because that's much easier, much more comfortable for me in the moment than facing up to you and dealing with what went wrong. I love my friend. Alcohol numbs his pain. It gets him through the day. So, so the loving thing to do is not to challenge him to address the root of that pain, but rather to affirm him on the path he's on. As a leader in the church, I love the congregation I'm part of. Not having to step out beyond what they've done before. Being able to come and go from church without having to open up about their faith, without having to share that faith with others. That makes them feel comfortable and secure. So the loving thing to do is not change anything. Or perhaps the loving thing to do is to lead one another. To step out from our temporary false security and comfort into God's eternal security and comfort that we find in the place beyond the limits of our abilities and control where we have nothing to rely on but him. In that place alone, following his promptings, being obedient, taking those leaps of faith. Do we grow and flourish together into all he desires us to be? The beginning of growing together in the healing, transforming love of Jesus is his affection within us at the centre of our being through our trust in him. From this base, walking and talking with our Saviour relying on his love for us, with scripture as our plumb line and our compass, we ask, what does acting in accord with God's will look like in this situation I'm in? If instead of starting from this base, from our relationship with Jesus in which he lives within us as a fountain of his love, if instead of starting from this base, we start with knowledge and an opinion, the result will be a judgmental, condemning spirit, self-satisfaction, self-righteousness. But when we start as Paul prays, with Christ's forgiving, embracing love, Christ's forgiving, embracing love that, that bears all things, believes all things, endures all things, when we start with this love in relationship, with people, caring for people in their struggles. And add knowledge and an opinion after we've done that. Then we will not fail to be instruments of God's healing and transformation. The source of our love as Christians is Jesus Christ. He, our risen, living Saviour, is a spring of divine love welling up within us. This love seeks to know and discern God's will more and more every day. We grow in it by asking first and foremost before we act. Not does this action make me feel good in the moment, but rather is this action eternally good and true? Is this action in accord with what God has revealed? In his word. Finally, what's the result of growing in God's love for us in Christ? The result is that we know more and more what truly matters and we'll be pure and blameless before God. Growing in God's love for us in Christ, we will be so caught up in sharing the good news of the gospel, so caught up in, 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 in living out the joy, the peace, the righteousness, the, the wonder of the kingdom, living out what Christianity is all about. But we won't be sidetracked and waylaid by the lure of material things, by disputes, differences, and clashes. We grow fully into the pure, spotless children of God. We already are in his eyes through our trust in his Son, our righteousness, 
Jesus Christ. Our lives will abound with acts of goodness, kindness, patience, mercy, understanding. Acts empowered and equipped by Jesus Christ living in us. That will bring his healing, transformation and blessing to others. As we go on this journey of growing together in love, there will be setbacks and failures along the way. At times we all do what we hate. We let down those we care for. Because there's still an old nature within us that's not submitted to God. Our freedom is not found as one theologian puts it, in abandoning the discomfort of God's revealed truth. For self-soothing versions that will plead our conscience and tickle our fancy. Rather, our freedom is found in crying out to God for mercy, crying out to God for help. Because there's no end to the forgiveness, grace, compassion, patience, and care that is in his redeeming love for each and every one of us. Whatever you're struggling with today, no matter how low you've sunk, abandoned, mistreated, you feel, that's the answer. Cry out to God for mercy and help. In your relationship with him, walking with him, talking to him, depending on him, seeking him, you'll find it. Because his love for you in his son, Jesus Christ, is without bottom or end. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We thank God for his love to us. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our closing hymn, O Thou Who Camest From Up. <coughs> <coughs>
with us this morning. And our prayer is that through your spirit, you would kindle a fire of secret love in our hearts. That in this world we would be ablaze for you, ablaze with your love. That through us as your channels, the, the hearts of others would be warmed and softened to be their trust in you. Make us channels of your love to this world that needs us. As we walk with you, as we talk with you, as we depend on you. In all situations, give us the grace to seek and discern your will as revealed in your word. That we may act it out in love. Lead us forth and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.